Opening day is in the books. And Peter, I have an issue, uh, but I have my solution too. Okay. The Pirates went to extra innings. They played 12. The Cubs went to extra innings. They lost. The White Sox lost one nothing. So all three teams that I really like identify with uh, had very stressful days. So I said hello to my old friend, Evan Williams. What do you got going on right now? I'm drinking water. I don't need any liquid courage. My Yankees and Juan Soto are giving me so much hype right now. What a game. What a game. I Crazy. love you, Juan Soto. All right. All right. I'll relax. I'll relax. But Welcome I am. To the I mean, I, I was smiling as, I mean, I wasn't smiling at the beginning, but as the game went along and Juan Soto did Juan Soto things, I just thanked the good Lord Juan Soto's a Yankee. Dude, I mean, Juan Soto with an outfield assist, like the world is crumbling to the ground right now. Nestor Cortez looked really shaky, but Framber Valdez, did Framber walk six? I, we're going to walk through every game. Yes. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go through game by game as an opening day recap. It's 11.08 p.m. on Thursday. This is the only time this season that I'm going to record this late until we get the postseason. So just know that I'm looking out for you, whoever's listening. Um, but Peter, tell us who we're brought to you by. Brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sports books. Remember, when you download on iOS or Android the BetMGM app, use code Just baseball and after you deposit they will offer you a first bet offer up to fifteen hundred dollars once you use the code absolute no-brainer do not leave free money on the table but remember terms and conditions apply must be 21 or older gambling problem call or text 1-800-GAMBLER can we skip all the rest of the games and just talk Yankees for like 45 minutes or not? No, we cannot. Right, I want to talk fine. about want all to 13 games. I want to talk about the nine games that happened this afternoon. Um, I want to talk about all 13 games that happened on Thursday. And then like we did draft the two games that were postponed until Friday. That was Mets, Brewers and Braves, Phillies. But we'll kind of preview those games at the tail end. Um, I do want to start with the first game that was kind of alone in the window. It was the first domestic game at 3 o'clock. Also, really bad scheduling by Major League Baseball, having the first game of the year not start until 3 o'clock. Where was my 1 o'clock first pitch? Not their fault. Brewers versus Mets got postponed. That was supposed to be the 1 o'clock. Was game. it a 1 o'clock? Okay. Can't blame, can't blame them. But I agree with you. I was sitting there at 1 p.m. I even tweeted it out that I'm just pacing through my apartment waiting for action. I need my opening day 1 p.m. game. And the fact that it got rained out, I felt like it was cursing the season a little bit. But thankfully, we had a great opening day. It was a great opening day. What I will also say, you know I'm a big college basketball guy. Yes, you are. I got a text that Clemson was beating Arizona at halftime. And my literal response was, oh, shit, I forgot college basketball was on. I forgot about the Sweet 16 because I was so enveloped in opening day. And is that more of a testament to opening day or is that more of an indictment on college basketball this year? I think it's a nice hybrid of both. I think it's a good medley. Having said that, I'm going to give all the credit to opening day. This delivered. And I want to start with Angels Orioles in Baltimore because the vibe at Camden Yards was immaculate. Mm -hmm. And you've got Mike Trout taking Corbin Burns deep in the first inning. And then Corbin Burns retires 16 in a row and punches out 11 in six innings of one hit ball. Corbin Burns, I'll tee you up in a moment. But before we get to that, this O's offense, Baltimore won this game 11 to 3. I texted our, our big just baseball group text. I was like, yes, like this lineup is the deepest in baseball because of the personnel, but it's also exhausting. Like they are so far and away going to lead the league in pitches per plate appearance. Mm -hmm. One through nine, this Orioles team is never going to lay down. I feel like we won't see an uncompetitive at bat for 162. And Adley Rutschman just continues his opening day dominance. I know he went two for two in his first two hits, and that means he was seven for seven in his last few opening days. You're He's right. only two because he came up midseason in twenty one or in twenty two. So opening day twenty twenty three and opening day twenty four. His career on opening day, he's what he's he started seven for seven. But I like how you mentioned pitches um, per plate appearance that this team is going to see a lot of pitches because you're 100% right. 
you would expect a young team like the Orioles with a lot of young guns trying to make their name in the show. It's opening day to be super aggressive, to get out of their approach. Nope. It looked like a bunch of veterans who have been there for 10 years. And what was kind of the Orioles' problem in the playoffs, right? It looked like the lights were a little bit too bright when they went up against Texas. Now, we understand the Texas Rangers won the World Series, so it's not a bad loss to lose to them. But it did seem like a couple of players on the Orioles just looked their age. They certainly did not look their age. Mike Trout homers in the first inning. Was any Orioles fan worried? And then instantly... It was a waterfall of runs. They are dangerous. They're overwhelming. And when we were doing our win total bets, right, Jack? We thought to ourselves, I mean, the Yankees had a great game, and I'm excited about them, but how can the Orioles not be the favorites in the American League, and at least in the AL East? No, I think they have to be the favorites in the American League East. I do think that Houston should be considered as the co-favorite in the American League just because of the pitching depth. I know now that Yankees, the Yankees beat them. So like nope. now it's it's really Yankees versus Orioles. And when you consider that, you know, the Yankees have Juan Soto, maybe it is the Yankees. You're right. <laughs> I have no rebuttal. That was awesome. Perfect. Was awesome. How about Corbin Burns? Um How about him, dude. Okay. We one saw quick, one quick joke. One yeah, quick okay. joke. Do you remember? So Aram picked Corbin Burns as his Cy Young pick. And Corbin Burns gives up a home run to Mike Trout. And I text in the group chat, hey, nice Cy Young pick, Arm. Look at what he's doing. He didn't give up a hit after that. That looked like a total dunce. And I was more just making fun of Arm, but he was just surgical. But at the same time, it's like the Angels lineup, you know, did him all the favors in the world. But he was still on, and he looked like vintage Corbin Burns. Think about it, Orioles fans. You're kind of now used to this offense. Are you used to a guy on opening day shoving six innings, one hit, one earned, 11 Ks down the Angels' throat? The only problem with the Angels is their pitching. It's not the offense that's a major issue. And Corbin Burns shut it down. It was sick. So the the curveball is not new to Corbin Burns' arsenal at all. It is his second most used pitch. He throws it 15 to 20 percent of the time over the course of, you know, each of the last three seasons. If I'm going back to 2021, 21, it was 18 percent of the time, 18 percent of the time in 22, 17 percent of the time in 23. That curveball felt almost remastered Mm. in start one. And and we saw Corbin kind of roll out of the gate slow last year. With Milwaukee, and maybe he was just frustrated, but like, remember that opening day start last year was not great. And the first month or so of Corbin Burns was not great. And then he settled in and it was Corbin Burns again. But man, like, this felt like an invigorated Corbin Burns. And and yeah, you see it with the cutter, surely. But I really saw it with the curveball. And I saw like how he kind of tinkered with it. And I was listening to the radio broadcast for a little bit for the Orioles. um, and, And they were talking about, how he really is hunting whiff with that curveball now. I mean, we saw it, and we saw him locking dudes up. It was the curveball that stole the show when it feels like any other time we talk about Corbin Burns, it's that cutter at 99 that's like dotted on the corner, and we love it, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. That bender, man, if Burns is right, if Bradish is back in early May, I hope he's back early May, and you get the best version of G-Rod, or at least the version of G-Rod that is improved from last year, I mean, that's a front three that I think can contend with really any team in baseball. Yeah, I'm not even going to add anything more to the Corbin Burns part because it's like one of those games where uh, Steph Curry shoots 60 Right, it's like, yeah, he's really good at shooting. Yeah, it's like, how how much better do I have to talk to you about how good Corbin Burns is? He was, I mean, he was vintage, one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball on opening day. At home, Birdland is out there spurting water for their guys. They don't have to do shit for the other team because they weren't scoring. One more point that I wanted to bring up about this game. Were you listening to the Orioles broadcast when you were watching the game or were you listening to the Angels? Uh, Orioles. Do you Did you hear the interview with their new owner, David Rubenstein? I did not, but I saw Kevin Brown tweet that he loved their conversation in the second inning. It was. If I was a fan of the Orioles, after everything that they've been through, to hear this man talk about what he wants to do, oh, 
I wished I was an Orioles fan during that entire statement because you know when like hedge fund guys come in or any owner and yeah. they want to take a big role in the team. Maybe it was their dream as a little kid and they want to pull a Jerry Jones where they're part GM, part owner. No, he said, I have Mike Elias. I'm going to let him do whatever he wants. And as an Orioles fan, knowing that Mike Elias is fantastic in the margins, but hasn't had the ammo to go make the big move. And now these guys are coming in and they're like, well, we can help sell season tickets. We can help, you know, with charities. But like, we're just trying to make the Orioles a better team financially to help Mike Elias continue to grow this team. He he made some jokes about the Magna Carta. He asked if there was a mercy rule in the second inning. I love David Rubenstein. I just came away from that being like, I wish you were my owner. So I, you're, you're kind of done with the Steinbrenners, huh? You know, I mean, you know, we're <laughs> one to know. We're one to know. I feel you are one to know. Juan Soto. I am going to go back and listen to that second inning conversation because everything that I've read, I really love the vibe. And that just sounds like somebody that I would immediately latch on to. And you think about the people that are trying to replicate the Jerry Jones template. It never works. No. But the people that find their own way to be involved with the team and still trust their lead decision makers on the baseball front are the ones that are great at this. Yeah. It did feel like Steve Cohen was overstepping his boundaries a little bit with Billy Epler, and hey, it's not working. We'll see if Steve Cohen continues to overstep boundaries with David Stearns. I assume not because he brought the right guy in to do it, but those two working in tandem is so important. That's why the Padres got really good. Peter Seidler loved the San Diego Padres. He wanted to see them be really good. He trusted A.J. Preller. And A.J. Preller, while we think he's a madman, he's maybe the best drafter in Major League Baseball. They develop like very few others can. And man, like when they're right, when they have that farm system replenished, he can go move for the big fish. Mike Elias just developed an organization that last year, at this time last year, March 28th, 2023, you could argue is twice as good as any other farm system in baseball. Yeah. You've got that guy in place. And now Give him the keys to the Ferrari. He was driving a yeah. Honda Civic for the last five years. Now you're giving Mike Elias money. Be yeah. afraid, rest of the American League. It's, it's Andrew off. Friedman. You've got a guy that was working on financial constraints, and you take him from a kiddie pool, and you put him in the Atlantic Ocean, and he can roam free. Cross-sport reference the vibe from David Rubenstein is very similar to Matt Ishbia when he took over the Phoenix Suns. Have you been following any of that? Not even a little bit. So Matt Ishbia, do your reading if you're interested, but he was like, I want to build the Suns back up and they're doing it. And right after Ishbia took over, they traded for Kevin Durant and they traded for Bradley Beal. So I'm all the way in on that. Should we move to the four o'clock first pitches? Let's do it. Let's start in Chicago, Detroit and the White Sox. Mm. Pitcher's duel. Mm. Who was better, Crochet or Scooble? I mean, Scooble was unconscious. But Crochet had a tougher assignment because have you seen this White Sox lineup? Mm -hmm. No, you have. But have you? I, I know you've seen it, but it's just... For anybody listening, have you seen it? I mean, it was a dumpster. So I had Tiger's money line, for example, and I'm getting a little <laughs> bit nervous in the later innings because I'm like, oh, what if the White Sox come back? They didn't never had a chance. So it's like Scooble did Scooble things. That's why I bet on him to win the Cy Young. Everything was working. But at the same time, he's blowing middle, middle fastballs by guys. It's just like I didn't I didn't come away from the start with Scooble learning anything new. I knew he was dominant. I knew that in his last two starts against the White Sox in the regular season in 23 through 12 innings, only allowed two runs, just dominates them. But how about Garrett Crochet? Holy shit. This was his first start in professional baseball. The last time he made a start was at the University of Tennessee. Did you know? that it was the first time the White Sox, their opening day starter, when it's his first start since 1901 with Roy Patterson? I mean, it makes sense. Like, why would you sense. ever run a guy out? Like, Think about this. The last time he threw the first pitch of a game 
was before the world shut down in March of 2020. Yeah. It's a long time ago. Did you see the cutter? It's disgusting. It's like what disgusting. he does, how he cuts the ball is disgusting. And he's a big dude that works downhill. He throws hard. He doesn't throw 102 anymore like he did at Tennessee. But man, like he's in the mid 90s. And that is it classified as a cutter? I know he's got a slider that's gross. Yeah, but so we, it, he was it, looking he had, great. It was the three pitches that looked like they were classified. It was this 98 mile an hour heater that just gets on guys. High ride. Big body Garrett Crochet. What is he? Six, 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 seven. He looks enormous on the mound, just coming at you with all legs, and it's like tight pants, and it's just it's at you so fast. Then he has this 94 mile an hour cutter. He takes a little bit off it and just has that little bit of cut, and guys just don't know what to do with it. And then the slider from hell. I was watching it being like, I mean, this is a diamond in the rough. I mean, this is incredible. But again, the Tigers' offense, I was also very disappointed with that it's entire not good. game. They, I was just like, who are the guys in either of these lineups that are going to make an impact today? So Luis Robert, Luis Robert is the guy in the White Sox lineup that's going to make an great. impact. And he the, no, great. he didn't. And then you've got, <laughs> no, he, he went one for four with two punch outs. And then you've okay. got, you know, Torque, like Riley Green's not at that level yet. I don't, I don't even know if Torque's at that level yet. No, neither of them are. I mean, they're both good. I both like them long term, but right now, I mean, you can't compare him to Luis Robert right now. No, no, absolutely not. Um, we were, I just sent you a screenshot of the Guardians lineup. I was like, this is a really not good lineup. And yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, J Ram is in the Luis Robert conversation. But aside from that, Bobby Witt Jr. is in that conversation when it comes to, you know, dynamic superstar hitters. But aside from that, the AL Central is starved for talent. Um, it was a one nothing game, it was a pitcher's duel. Scooble, as of right now, is leading opening day starters in swings and misses. I think he got 20 whiffs. In he's, six he's innings, disgusting. I mean, he's it was disgusting. Phenomenal. You combine Scoobal and Crochet's lines was twelve innings, eight hits, one run, fourteen punch outs, no walks between yep. the two. Crochet, I was expecting like three, four walks. Oh. The fact that we got six innings, one run, eight punch outs, no walks, amazing. My I'm dumb. very happy as a White Sox person. I'm I'm very happy. My dumbass bet him under four and a half strikeouts. He hadn't gone more than four innings in a spring training start. Then he goes six. Don't know what to tell. Dominant you. innings. One more thing that I wanted to run across you that I just found was interesting. Alex Lang is supposed to be the closer for the Tigers. In a How about one zero game, a hundred. 101 mile an hour sinkers. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> but I mean, he's always thrown gas with the sinker, but 101, I haven't seen that out of Foley. But it was chafing for four outs, and then Foley got the last two. And I was thinking to myself are they saving lang did he lose the job what is this because I, I was just i didn't i didn't understand i mean it worked out didn't matter i mean they could have thrown me literally in there in the last thing <laughs> i mean these guys these white Sox hitters had no shot but i would have expected their closer in a 1-0 game on opening day but i mean foley looked great so did chafin but again it's the white Sox, so i don't know it is the White Sox. I, I don't know what happened with Lang. I don't have an answer to that. And I don't I haven't seen anything that AJ Hinch said. So it remains to be seen, I guess. Yep. I was looking Let's for what AJ Hinch might have said, and there was nothing. It was just nothing. Nothing. Let's move to the Nick Martini game. Eight yep. two. The Reds beat the Nats. Nick Martini, a guy that Clay Snowden, our guy, our our staff writer at just baseball, was tweeting like why is he on the roster? And I'm with him. I'm like, why is Nick Martini playing when you could just DH India and have Espinal play second? And then Nick Martini, in his first plate appearance of the season, hits a tank and a half out to right field as part one of a multi-homer day. Reds win 8-2. Martini was awesome. Great. He's not going to have 160 home runs this year. Frankie Montes might be that dude, though. Frankie went with six scoreless, four punch outs, no walks. Frankie Montas, final line, six innings, four hits, no runs, four Ks, no walks. Amazing from Frankie Montas. I don't want to interrupt this game because I do want to keep talking about it. But as we are talking, the Diamondbacks just put up 14 runs in the third inning. Yeah, 16 to one. Not ideal for Kyle Freeland. I not great. Keep up. Dead. Hope you didn't have Rockies money line. <laughs> I did not. I did not. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit embarrassing, but we could talk about that at the end. Yeah, I thought Frankie Montas pitched really, really well. Um, 
a lot of soft contact, breaking balls were working. It looked like the guy who was on the A's that the Yankees traded three or four prospects for. But he was hurt his entire time on the Yankees, and I thought Foolish Baseball had a great tweet. Frankie Montas is just imitating Sonny Gray's career. I yeah. thought that was hilarious. But it's, again, like, I personally didn't pull a ton away from the start because I also thought the Nationals just showed up for nothing. I mean, Josiah Gray did not look good at all. The offense, I thought, just put up terrible at-bats. They were swinging first pitch at bad at bad pitches. I, like, I did think Frankie Montas pitched well. But I think it's, this game was more of an indictment on the Nationals than it was on the Reds. Personally. They were... Yeah, I mean, they were lethargic. Like, Joey yeah. Manessis was two for four with two singles. Took until Emilio Pagan came in for them to get on the board. It was a two-run homer from Eddie Rosario. That was it. Yeah, I, like, I, I really didn't have much reactions from that game. Yeah. Um, I thought the Reds handled business against a guy in Josiah Gray, who I'm pretty down on this year. Uh, we saw him firsthand in spring training. I didn't think he looked that great. His peripherals were not good last year. And the Reds just took care of business. With Nick Martini, right? Um, yeah, I really didn't have any major takeaways from that other than Frankie Montas looked good, but I need to see more because the Nationals, I thought, looked so terrible. Yeah. But Twins Royals in Kansas City, Minnesota wins at mm. 4-1. The, the story here, and listen, Pablo Lopez was great. Cole Reagan's, I thought, was really solid. Cole Reagan, six innings, two runs, nine punch outs. Pablo, seven innings, a one-run ball. Cade, seven, no walks. Reagan's allowed a homer. It was to Royce Lewis. And then Royce Lewis goes first to third. It fucks up his quad. We're waiting on the severity of it. But, man, this is unreal what's going on with Royce Lewis. And, you know, I, I made the quip, and, like, I didn't mean it in a joking manner at all. He gets hurt. And the Royals broadcast immediately flashes a Royce Lewis injury history graphic. It, it's like you have it stocked. That's where we're at with Royce Lewis. And he's so talented. I don't want to call it frustrating because, frankly, it's really sad. It, it's hard for me to latch on because as soon as we get that taste, it just goes away like that all the time. I'm I'm rooting for Royce. I hope it's just like tightness i hope justin Steele is just tightness at his hammy but man like this guy's fragility i if i was a twins fan i'd be i'd be stirring and i'd be losing sleep knowing that you got to deal with buxton and royce lewis in this way royce lewis yes he takes cole reagan's deep on like a 97 mile an hour fastball and just pulls it out of kaufman stadium but then i thought his next day be Bullet slider, 87 miles an hour on the black, and he takes it to left field on just a perfect swing. And then when he's rounding third, it's just the quad thing again. And, you know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn at all, but isn't it exactly what I described when we were talking about our top 100 or my top 100, where I was like, he is more talented than most third basemen, but his inability to stay on the field is extremely frustrating. Because it's it's almost like a Buxton thing, right? I hope it never gets there, but it's immense talent. But just cannot stay on the field. But Pablo Lopez looked really, really good. He gave up that first home run to Michael Garcia, and he was throwing like 94 miles an hour. And then the next AB was back up to 97. And it was like, hey, I can't take it easy here. And he just cruised through this Royals lineup. But again, like, yeah... I, I don't know what else to say about Royce Lewis. When he's on the field, he's, what, a top 25 talent? Yeah. But he's not on the field enough. And then we just get this again. And, like, if I'm a Twins fan, I'm just tearing my hair out. Like, he got the win. It feels good. He deserved the win. Pablo looked great. Carlos Correa looked pretty damn good, too, on defense. He did look damn good. It's just, it's disappointing. It's disappointing when you win on opening day, but there's already issues. I'm feeling for Twins fans. There are a couple of guys to me that I'm like, okay, if you are good, then baseball is better. Trout went yard today. I had that feeling. It's like baseball's oh, yeah. just better when Mike Trout's great. 
And baseball is better when Anthony Rendon is sucking to strike out <laughs> the game to, or he his first the game, air, strike yeah. out of the air. I was like, oh, this is poetry. Good. And then he, he had like a good three inning stretch there. And then it was like, yeah, I'm checked out yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, it's like reverse nap time. As soon as the clock hit like 3.30 for him, he was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Um, just a late start. But the game is great when Mike Trout is great. I think baseball is better when Carlos Correa is great. Mm-hmm. And and I think that Carlos Correa is primed for a bounce back year. Is it greatness? I don't know. Is it really good? I hope so because he was only good last year. The defense um, looked elite. There was a couple of these hit the slide that he does and then jumps back up and just fires over the first. Very, he's so good at that. He's a very unique cat. He he's he's got one of the best arms in all of baseball. And he's a big dude that knows how to use his body perfectly at shortstop. Yeah. It's a fun yeah. watch. You mentioned O'Neill Cruz, and like we'll talk about him in a moment because he's a freakazoid, but like it's it's that kind of thing where it's like okay you are an unorthodox shortstop but you play it in a in a way that I like watching that's my thing with Correa it's like he doesn't fit the mold of like your classic silky smooth six foot one shortstop yeah, it's not like he's a, a Trey big, Turner or no, like you know, a Lindor or you know he's these a big guys guy that plays just, it like a big guy yeah he plays it like he, I mean he looks like a third baseman playing shortstop but he gets every ball and he fires it over there at 100 miles an hour and he looked great at the plate it was just good to see like healthy Carlos Correa play baseball because people forget he is arguably one of the best shortstops in baseball yeah. Speaking of 100 miles an hour, talk to me about the 112 off the bat from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. in an 8-2 win in Tampa. It was awesome, man. Vladdy hit that home run, and he got a bunch more hits in that game, didn't he? Vladdy was oh no, one, for, one five for five with a bunch No, of... but hey, hey, that home run, like, let's celebrate it. And we're not going to talk about how Bichette went two for four with the double and, <laughs> you know, played really good defense. No, but Vladdy did hit that home run as a first baseman. He did hit a home run today. Good for you, Vladdy. Hell yeah. You got your home run. I hope Vladdy, you know, Vladdy's got a thousand OPS. He's yeah, got a thousand, thousand OPS. What's Bichette's OPS? What'd you 1350. Oh, it is. Oh, that's funny. Why'd you bring up Vladdy, by the way? Well, it doesn't fit my agenda. Zach Eflin struggled at home. No, he didn't struggle. I thought Kevin Cash just left him in for no reason. I mean, he went five and two thirds, six earned. Yeah, but like it was all in the later innings. I mean, it, it, you it know, was they, a five they, spot. They, they yeah, early. Yeah, I, I, thought he pitched, I thought he pitched really well. It looked like he was gas at the end of the fifth and they just kept him in. I didn't really understand why. Um, and then he got pelted in the sixth inning. Uh, so I'm not putting a lot of stock in Eflin's start. I didn't think he got killed. I thought he ran out of gas at the end, and then the Blue Jays piled on. And good for the Blue Jays. They look great. How about Barrios? Yeah, I'm making fun of like Vladdy. I don't want to take it away from the Blue Jays' performance today. No, no. I'm Jays not. were Jays we're, were, awesome. we're screwing around here, but I mean, Springer if you're a Blue Jays fan, because you do not have a good history in the trop. They are no. under 500 in the last three seasons. I think they're like 36 and 57 yeah. career at the Trop. It's just not good. But to come in opening day, when you have the, and for all those watching on YouTube, quote unquote, inferior pitcher, right? I think a lot of people would say Eflin is the better pitcher than Barrios. Yeah. But Barrios did not back down, right? Yandy Diaz hits that leadoff home run. And I'm, th- and I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is a Rays blowout, right? It's just the Rays are back. Nope, settled down and looked great, was surgical. And it was really a pitcher's duel until that last inning. Yeah, he was um, in five-run sixth. That was what put it away. But just question for you, who who do you think was the MVP of that game? I'm just asking. What do you think? Do you think it was Bichette? Peter, I think it was Bo Bichette. Oh, okay. No, just curious. Okay, we're going to move on to the West <laughs> Coast. Before that, quick break. We're not moving totally out west yet. We are going to the south and just west of the southeast for the Yankees and the Astros. The Yankees win that one 5-4. Juan Soto with a huge outfield assist. Oswaldo Cabrera went yard in a big moment. Fromber couldn't really throw a strike to save his life. Nestor struggled. This was a weird game, and I was really excited for this game. It was a fun game, but like in different ways than I was expecting and hoping. 
crazy game. The Yankees left 10 runners on base and still won. First inning, ground ball double play with bases loaded. Second inning, ground ball double play, bases loaded. I think they had another one in the fourth. I'm pretty sure they had three total. And it looked like a disaster early on. And as a Yankee fan, right, we're going into Minute Maid at Houston against Framber with Nestor, Nestor Cortez Jr., who hasn't looked that great in spring training. I kind of chalked it up as an L. And then watching the first few innings, right, the Astros put up four almost immediately. And I'm thinking, oh, God, another season like this. But then Juan Soto hits the ball in the gap. And you could just see the energy changing with the Yankees. Volpe put up good ABs. I thought Verdugo put up some good ABs. You know, Judge still got his hit. Judge didn't look great, but whatever. Stanton did not look good, but whatever. But the energy. This is a game that the Yankees have lost over the past five years. They lose this game. It is. But they won it today. And seeing Judge and Soto dap up in the outfield... That that had to get oh, you fired oh, up in a way oh that you haven't God. been I mean, fired I, up. Like I, I haven't been this happy about Yankees baseball in a long time. Did that get you aroused? Like, oh, let's yeah. be honest. Oh yeah. I mean, okay. I, yeah, I don't even want to be graphic, but I'm sure <laughs> you, you could use your imagination about did what you, I was doing. Did my you couch. let out like a sound where you're like, oh, oh my me. God. I mean, it's we have one Soto. <laughs> Having one Soto on your team is a different beast. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Ah. Uh, that game was awesome. And no, Nestor settled in, though. You know, he, he got did. his punchies. Command was a little bit better. The fastball velocity actually looked fine. It looked better than what it was in spring training. He just got it in. He r- got roughed up early. Loisaga came in and looked really good. I, I'm banking on that guy to have a good year. I think Loisaga is not the X factor, but he is an X factor for the New York Yankees. Especially if Clay Holmes is a little bit fidgety. He did not look great in the last inning. No. Um, and Juan Soto throwing that runner out at home, man. Dude, I was smiling ear to ear when we finally got on the board, and they just kept battling that energy. The Yankees have been without it for a while. The comeback, the never say die. And then I love Joe Girardi in the booth with Paul O'Neill and Michael Kay. I, I just had a great time. I yeah, it sounds action. like you had an awesome Thursday afternoon. And Astros fans, I know you guys are listening. You're probably just so sick of here. Give me a break. You guys have been beating the shit out of us yeah. like basically my entire adult life. And Give like, me this and, one. Give me this one. And hey, Jake Myers went yard. Like that's something to be happy about. Oh, yeah. Panic level with Fromber. Scale of 1 to 10. Not really that panic because I thought his stuff looked good. He just had no idea where it was going, which I more chalk up to just like early season woes but at the same time this was happening last year right so maybe this is a continuation but the stream i was watching on it had like a different camera view and i'm watching his sinker dart into the zone and his off-speed pitches this is disgusting yeah it's the yankees it's all hard and you gotta give the yankees credit here like framber did not look good but the yankees put up excellent abs they were not chasing all those curveballs in the dirt that they've been swinging at for years. They weren't swinging at them. They had a plan and they attacked. And even when they went down, they never gave up. I'm over the moon. I I mean, that was, I was smiling year to year, man. I dig it. I forgot about one game on the East Coast. So we're going to go back to it. Pirates beat the Marlins 6-5 and 12. I loved that game. I watched like from seven onward. That was all I was watching. Luis Ortiz looked amazing. Did you see that O'Neill Cruz home run? That left his bat at 106 miles an hour. And if you haven't seen the video, go back and watch the video because it looks like he should have popped out to shortstop. But he's such a big dude that swings so hard, so fast through the zone that that somehow left his bat at 106 and found its way over the left field fence. In Lompico, which is a big, which is a big park. I cannot believe him. He is, he does something literally unbelievable. And we talk often about how much I hate that word. And I think that's starting to rub off to Aram too. He's like, uh, he's noticing every time he says the word unbelievable. He's like, yeah, no, overused. It's not overused with him. No, it's like not. you see that swing and, and you see the result six seconds later. And you're like, how did that happen? He also has the most ath- aesthetically 
aesthetically. I said aesthetically. That pleasing yeah. throw over to first base. It's like a slingshot. And I was, you know, we were talking about Crea and comparing them. Yeah, Crea might have similar velocity, but it ain't close in terms of just the freaking no. torque that comes out of that man. It's a O'Neal bad is, man. That's O'Neal a bad man looser. in Pittsburgh. He's looser. Yeah, he's a dangerous man. I will say that Keller didn't look good. Mitch Keller, five and two-thirds, seven hit, five runs, four of which earned. I'm not... Respectfully, I thought he looked like ass. I, he, I he thought he looked, looked terrible. Good. Like, it was it was a very laborious five and, and two-thirds. And also yeah. terrible for his standards, because his standards last year, he was All excellent. Right. And then to do that, no strikeouts, the stuff didn't look great. It looked like it was a tune-up game for him. It just didn't look right at all. That's why I thought he looked terrible because it was more almost body language and velocity and, you know, dibbling around the corners. I was like, this isn't Mitch Keller. This isn't the Mitch Keller with a high 90s fastball when he's just breaking off that sweeper from hell. Looked like a watered-down version of him. I expect way more from him. I'm with you. Um, I thought Lazardo was good. I thought the bullpen was not good. I thought Keller was not good. I thought the Pirates bullpen was really good. Pirates bullpen had seven shutty. They look great. Was, I mean, Hunter Stratton, a guy that I've spent the last two years with in Indianapolis. I love that that guy is is shoving and he's good, man. Yeah, like, yes. I they think people are going to realize that he's good and like a legitimate big leaguer. And remember, no Bednar either. Bednar never came in. No, Bednar. We were like, where is Bednar? But apparently he's, he's still working his way back from a lat issue. Mm. Ryan Barucki hitting in a third, two punch outs, no hits. He went four up, four down. Araldis Chapman went three up, three down. Luis Ortiz, two scoreless innings and extras. And then Jose Hernandez, who like, I was sitting there at Indians Media Day yesterday. And we were like, where is Jose Hernandez? He's supposed to be here. And it's like, oh no, he's got to go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> like the injury, he's he's the call up for opening day. Cat gets a save. He was supposed to be in media day in AAA on Wednesday, and he gets a save on opening day on Thursday. And That's kind of fun. He has a good little breaking ball there. That break, he, like, he looked good. I know. I five mean, guy last year. If if you're a Pirates fan after that game, you have to be over the moon. The fact that Mitch Keller gave you nothing, you didn't really hit much off Lazardo. I know you got your two runs, but you know I, you didn't play well against Lazardo. But you kept battling, and that Miami Marlins bullpen. It's not a bad bullpen by no, any No, like the Nardi's good. Nardi got yeah. hit a couple times, but that's that's yeah. all right. Like Nardi looked is, good. Nardi was great last year, and the Pirates came up and and they did their business against him, and they just kept in it and kept in it. And do I have to repeat? Do I have to say it again? The Marlins one run rule, thirty three and thirteen last year, and now they're zero and one, and they blew a three run lead, and they lose the one run game. It's going to happen to the Marlins this year. I don't think they're going to be on the right side of it. That's all I got to say. I mean, Tim Anderson had a double. Okay, did that? He did have a double. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. I didn't really have many takeaways from the Marlins offense. Did you? No, no, I didn't. Um, I loved the TA double. That was really... Because I just thought Mitch Keller looked terrible. That's where they got the runs. Yeah, they were capitalized. Then it just shut off. So it's like, yeah... I, again, it's it's more of an indictment on Keller. It's not that I didn't think that the Marlins didn't play well offensively. It's just if Keller had his stuff, I don't think the Marlins would have scored at all. Yeah. Also, Connor Joe saved an O'Neill Cruz throwing error that would have allowed a run to score. Respect Huge. Connor Joe. Respect, Respect my King Joe. Um, let's go to San Diego here. 6-4 Padres win over the Giants. I really enjoyed this game. Conforto had a good game. Conforto had a double and a homer. But I loved the pitcher's duel. I loved the front five innings of this game. You Darvish went five innings of one run ball, struck out seven. Logan Webb, six innings, two runs, punched out five. Webb, his shit moves in ways that no other pitcher's shit moves. He had a he had like a two-seamer sinker to Jackson. 23 Merrill. inches of horizontal. And as soon as I saw that happen, I'm like pitching ninja. Because I was like, I feel so bad for you, Jackson Merrill. I mean, that's impossible. Nobody on planet Earth could hit that. Welcome to the big leagues, buddy. Hip, and it looked like it was going to hit him, and it ended up middle. I, I just, Logan Webb can do things with the baseball that few can, but he looked pretty good. I mean, he looked, he, he, he looked okay. Darvish looked okay. 
Like they both did their thing, but I, I really wasn't in pressed by this game at all there was nobody that really jumped out of me i it's good to see jung who league at his first hit mm-hmm. um but overall this was one of the games that i also didn't really have any takeaways i thought it was one of those games where it was like darvish and webb pitch fine offense came in spurts against bad pitches and the padres won the game i'm sorry that's just i didn't also catch a ton of this game but the innings i did catch i was just like eh, yeah Pretty good game. There were there were a lot of games to watch. Um, this game that I'm about to bring up, I really didn't catch much at all. I saw Glass now dominate out of the corner of my eye. I was like, you know, it was like fourth screen for me, or like fourth part of the quad box for me. And I was like, oh yeah, good. Glass now shoving against the St. Louis Cardinals. All right, Glass now six innings, two hits, one run. Dodgers win seven one. That top of the Dodger lineup, Mookie, Otani, Freddie Freeman was amazing. Miles Michaelis got roughed up. That was my only thing. Did you keep tabs on this? I did, and I wish I didn't because it made me so mad at the Cardinals. What a pitiful performance by the offense. Just pitiful. They had three hits. Goldie had all three of them. Yep. I was so disappointed. Because I also didn't think that Glassnow even had his best stuff. And yet, they couldn't do shit with it. And I know Glassnow, even without his best stuff, is still Tyler Glassnow. I get it. But the ABs, like there was nothing from the Cardinals offense. And it looked exactly like the same team from last year. Just lethargic not trying to get after. It looked like as soon as the Dodgers put up those runs, the game was over. And I'm not even really talking about Michaelis. Like, Michaelis, yeah, he got beat the hell up by the Dodgers. It's going to happen. He's also one of the worst opening day starters, I think, in the history of Major League Baseball. Even had those comments after the game where he's like, it's not my worst opening day. I know he's just joking, but... Like, Michaelis didn't pitch well. If Michaelis is starting opening day for this Cardinals team and the offense shows up like that, It's going to be another terrible season for the Cardinals. I was just really excited to watch this offense come to play, especially in this series against the Dodgers. It's a beautiful day, and they just laid an egg. Get in the shower. They looked like ass. They probably smelled like it, too. (laughs) I was so disappointed with the offense. I really was. When do you start blaming the lethargy on the guy on the top step of the dugout that just got extended? I don't know. They we were, them. They're obviously sold. I don't know what they're doing. But like, dude, I don't know what we they're doing. Were, we were blaming the lethargy on him last year, and we were blaming all the media gaffes on him last year because it was him that was committing all the media gaffes. The Tyler O'Neill saga was stupid. The Wilson Contreras saga was stupid. And now you see this team lay an egg on opening day? Come on. Be better. Be better. And you have to remember, Cardinals fans, you're probably hearing this and being like, shut up, guys. One game. We hold you no, to a higher this standard. Is a, this is 163 games. Of I this agree. Pie. That's why I was going to continue into it, too, because it's like this has been happening. And you guys are the St. Louis Cardinals. You have the second most World Series in the history of Major League Baseball to the Yankees. But you, you <laughs> already knew that. No, but the Cardinals are a historic franchise. All right. You had your down year. Everyone has a down year. It's okay. Bounce back. And even if you lose this game, show a little bit of fight. A little bit. They didn't. They laid down. I was so disappointed. I was so disappointed in this team. Because I expect so much better from them. Yeah, understandably so. We move to the night slate to wrap uh, final in 10 in Arlington. Jonah Heim walked it off. 4-3, the win over the Cubs. Was it a foul ball? Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Like, obviously. They I mean, fucked it. Anyone with eyes could have seen that. Why is that not a reviewable play? That makes no sense. Like, I don't know. Strikes is technically rule A in the hit. Shut up, nerd. Review the play. Get it right. Why are we doing this? Why don't if we have reviews sometimes, but not other times, review it all? Why not? We'll take five minutes. Get the play right. End of rant. I was I was just like, it's opening day. Don't do this shit on the Tuesday. ESPN broadcast. Like, yeah, like it, it's it's Sunday night baseball on Thursday night. Like you better have this shit right. And they just didn't have this shit right. I'm with you, Val Ball. Um, it was a really entertaining game. There were really no like 
true standouts in this one. Christopher Morrell had a nice game, which I really appreciated. Did you see um, that foul ball yet? No. I think he hit it like 600 feet. I saw a foul ball. <laughs> Not six. I just thought he had a foul ball that I thought was 500 feet plus. Interesting. Had, yeah. It was good to see Lankford leg out his first hit. Um, that was like a Is fun one. Enough? I wish though? he went yard, but I like infield it's... single for Wyatt Langford. It's like the guy who, you know, has this crazy power and he's going to hit 45 hit. in his rookie year and it's an like infield single. First hit is an infield single. That's baseball for you. I wasn't, thought that, that, wasn't that Harper's first hit? I don't know. Mm, it might. So Harper's first hit was either an infield single or it was. Wasn't it a that ball double? over the shortstop? It was that ball to the other way. I, feel I thought like I remember it was, Young Harper. I don't know if that was his first hit. I thought it could have been a double directly over the center fielder's head. I feel like it was in LA and it was right over Matt Kemp's head. Fact check me and tell me in the YouTube comments like the situation that brought Bryce Harper like, his was, first. But big wasn't it hit. kind of the other way? If I think we're thinking about the same play. Whatever. Let's talk I about the Rangers and the Cubs. I don't know. Um, Steel it was a fun down. game. Steel going down was a disaster. Yeah, but it it seemed like he was mouthing the word cramp. Oh, and then the and then the official report was hamstring tightness. Okay, good, good. I would assume that's cramp. I don't know if that's going to result in an IL stint. I don't think it would result in an IL stint if it's a cramp. Okay, good. Because the way he went down after it, it looked like he tore his hamstring. And then he's on his back and he had to limp off. If that's the case, thank God. I mean... You get Royce Lewis in the early game. Then on Thursday night baseball, we see Justin Steele go down when he was pitching well. He's pitching really well, I thought. I mean, that's a tough Rangers lineup that you're going into Arlington. Fired up after they won a World Series opening day. Crowds fully on their side, and he comes in that with that Mississippi fastball. That was one of the more impressive outings, even though the stat line didn't look great. But I thought he was surgical early. This from Taylor McGregor. Per Craig Council, Justin Steele has a left hamstring strain. He will get an MRI tomorrow to determine severity. IL stint, quote, likely, according to Craig Council. Hopefully it's not long. Hopefully it's, a Hopefully couple, it's not long. A couple turns to the rotation. I mean, it but, sucks. I don't want to talk about his injury because I love him and I don't want him to be injured. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm totally with you. Um, Arm texted, Cubs need a closer. I agree. But Alzali... We were having this conversation during the offseason. I think Elzali is a fine closer. I think he's a really good setup guy. Yeah, probably. I wouldn't say that's their issue, though. I mean, who's, no. throwing, who's throwing game three for the Cubs? Who's throwing game three and like, <laughs> hey, who's hitting six? I mean, Bush is hitting six, but like you need some depth in that lineup. And that lineup, it's it's good, not great as of right now. It's kind of like the entire Cubs team. It's like good, not great. They're just missing that like, you know, that thing. Shohei Otani? Yeah, they're missing him. They're missing Shohei. Jordan. They could use Jordan. They could absolutely <laughs> use a Ronald Acuna Jr. in center field, or in right field, I guess. Although Seiya's got to play right. Give no, me a Shout out Jonah Heim. Rocketed that ball to right field for the walk-off. That's got to that feel awesome. good, man. That's got to feel good for him. That was great. Quick note before we move on to the late slate. I just I needed to remind myself of this stat, and I heard Pat Hughes say it on the Cubs radio broadcast. Corey Seager became the fourth guy to collect multiple World Series MVPs. Do you know who his company is? I feel like we brought this up like when he won World Series MVP, but he is the fourth guy in Major League history with multiple World Series MVPs. I can't even think of one right now. Just tell me the answer. It's going to take so, me a while anyway. Reggie Jackson. Oh, duh. Bob Gibson and didn't Sandy Koufax. Yeah, that makes sense. So, like, I can't I, believe I, just, I didn't I, remember Reggie Jackson immediately. That's on Mr. October. I, I heard that grouping and I was like, hold on, like, pause. Let me rewind and let me hear it again. Corey Seeger, Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson, Reggie Jackson. That's an amazing group. Yeah, I mean, I think Corey Seager, as long as he stays healthy, is going to be a Hall of Famer. He's got a long way to go. He's got I mean, a long but, way to go, and but we he is talk, only thirty. We could talk about that in a on a later day. But also, you hear when they were talking about the broadcast, like all of the guys were going first pitch, they were taking a note out of Corey Seager's, you know, handbook. I just love that he's the guy. 
You he's know, the he's, he's, guy. he's the driver of the bus and this offense. I mean, they didn't even have a good day and they still put up four. Evan Carter hit eighth. Yeah. Against a lefty. A top five know. prospect in baseball hit eighth. And didn't get any hits against the lefty. Yeah. It's okay. Am, am I cooked? Am I cooked? Probably. Late slate, we just got a hit on quickly. We started recording in like the middle innings of the late slate. I did get to watch the first three innings of Shane Bieber, and Bieber recorded his first seven outs via punch out. He was sitting 92-93. That is a different Shane Bieber. He was sitting 94 in 2020, but that was, you know, a sprint. It was across 11 starts, and he won the Cy Young. If Shane Bieber is sitting 92-93, I am mortgaging the farm to go trade for him at this deadline. 100% he could win the Cy Young because he could be a good pitcher sitting 89-90. He's, I mean, he's a great pitcher sitting 89-90. He was sitting 90, I think low 91, like 91.2 last year, and he had a 3-8 ERA in eight innings. Like eight, like eaten, eat the food, like an eight innings. Yeah. If he is 92-93 and he gives you 180 innings, I mean, man, the, he is, okay, right back to the theme of the show. When Mike Trout is great, it's good for baseball. When Shane Bieber is right and you get to watch him carve every fifth day, that's pitching porn. Because, I mean, what's another pitcher in Major League Baseball right now that could be as surgical as Shane Bieber throwing in the low 90s? You can't really name him. No. I mean, like, at Kershaw when he's healthy. True. Steel, kind of. But Steel. He's not, not, like, low 90s. He's, like, 93, 95. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah, it's like Kershaw, that's kind of it. So, it's I, I, I personally didn't even get to watch the game. So, like, I'm speaking out of my ass here. I'm just looking at the numbers. But the numbers look good. And this is why I was so high on the Guardians, because I think they have the best rotation in the division. And we're looking at the lineups throughout this division, right? You're making fun of the Guardians lineup. Look at the other lineups today. I mean, not great. So, I think they can really make some noise. They're up 6-0 right now as we're, as we're, as we're talking. You know, the A's are, you know, I still think they're going to win 60 games, but not a great start. Not a great A's start. Uh, not a great start for the Colorado Rockies either. Top of the sixth inning, it's 16 to 1 Arizona over the Rockies after a 14 run third. And this game is not at Coors Field, it's in Phoenix. Kyle Freeland, two and a third, 10 earned runs. So his ERA after start one is 38.57. Anthony Molina, I feel so bad for you, dude. Rule five pick from the Rays, 22 year old, got one out. Six hits, six earned. A murder. How about Jalen Beeks coming in to uh, soften the blow? Two and a third right now. Two Ks, no runs. Kicking ass. Gallon went five innings. Punch outs weren't there, but it was five innings, one earned. Great. Um, Guriel Homer. Guriel's yeah. five RBIs already. I mean, we're, we're recording right now. I mean, what, we're in the fifth inning. He's got five ribbies. There yeah, are Moreno five guys. There are five guys in this lineup in this in the top of the sixth inning with a multi-hit day. There are two guys with a three-hit day. Quetel Marte's three for four. Lourdes Gurriel, three for four with five driven in. Christian Walker's got two knocks. Gabby Moreno's got two knocks. Eugenio Suarez has two. Blaze Alexander has his first big league hit. Um every oh my god. Everybody except Corbin Carroll has a hit in the Diamondbacks lineup. Corbin Carroll, though, has two walks and two runs scored, though, so it's not like he's doing nothing. Go ahead with your 500 OPS, Corbin Carroll. Last game that we got to hit, uh, pardon, through six, Boston ahead of Seattle, 5-2. Luis Castillo started for Seattle, five innings, four earned. Uh, Brian Bale, five innings, two earned for Boston. Um, Rafi Devers hit a homer, set on Rafaela tripled. I didn't watch a moment of this game because we were recording. So I hope you're happy, Red Sox fans. You're winning. Yeah, I'm just looking at the numbers here. Brian Bayo's velocity is up. Hit 98 today. Brian Bayo hit 98? Brian Bayo hit 98 today. His fastball or his sinker is up 1.1 miles an hour from normal, which is pretty good. Changeup's up almost two miles an hour, and the slider's up almost three. I mean, that's kind of, if you're a Red Sox fan, you got to be pretty excited about that. Good for you. Good All for right. you. Your newly I mean, extended opening day starter. 
I apologize, Red Sox and Mariners fans. I haven't watched a second of this game, but the no, Red Sox are like ahead five to two right now. Like, shout out Boston. How about this win right now? You were underdogs. Okay. Okay. Devers, bomb, Oppo. Okay. Okay. Uh, two opening day games coming up today. Who wins and why? At 140 in New York, Jose Quintana gets the ball for the Mets against Freddie Peralta and the Brewers. Who wins? Why? I'm going to go with the Brewers, but I think this is going to be one of those really close games, kind of similar to Cubs Rangers or Pirates Marlins, where it might go into extra innings or something. Um, I just think that the Brewers have the better starting pitcher on the mound. We love Freddie Peralta. I still think Jose Quintana is a good pitcher. I just would give the edge to Freddie. I would also give the edge to the Brewers bullpen, even though you still get Edwin Diaz and you have no Devin Williams for the Brewers, they're just so much deeper than I think the Mets are. But offensively, I would give the edge to the Mets here. And the Mets are also really, really good on their opening day. So I'll go with the Brewers. I think they win in like a 4-3 type game. I'm going Mets in a higher scoring game. I think 6-4 Mets because the Mets can score six, and I'm not sure if the Brewers can score six. Do you think they really get to Freddie like that? Or you think it's more bullpen? Or where, where are they getting the runs off of? I don't know. It feels like some middle inning fever dream type shit. I could get behind like that. Maybe I'm not end sold of on Freddy, either side. I could end of that. Freddy and a middle relief guy. Yeah, like Hobie Milner comes in, gives up sure. a freaking three-run bomb. I could see it. Yeah, like yeah. Pete Alonzo <laughs> goes yard, and it's like, oh, Alonzo. And then Ethan Badowski, our social superstar, just <laughs> texts us the gator emoji. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's sick. Yeah, great. Whenever a gator does anything, he lets us know he went to Florida. Yeah, he went to Florida. Um, Strider Wheeler at 305, the game of opening day that we had to wait 24 hours for. I'm going to be locked into this one. I think Atlanta wins 2 1. Yeah, I love this under for all my people in MGM. One and a half unit play for me. And you know, I don't often do that. It's Strider versus Wheeler with 15 mile an hour wind blowing in at Citizens Bank Park, one of the most affected ballparks by wind in Major League Baseball, second to only two Wrigley Field. I think this is going to be a very, very good pitcher's duel. Wheeler's velocity has been down a bit in spring training, but the numbers still look good in terms of a run prevention standpoint. We know what Strider's done. Fully tuned up bullpens. I know everybody's really, really excited to see these offenses go to work but it might have to be the day after because you got Strider against Wheeler, second and third best pitchers in Major League Baseball. For me, Cole now hurt, so probably first and second. This is a pitcher's duel, and I cannot wait to hear Strider, (laughs) Strider. And Strider's going to give it to him, and I think he's going to dominate. I got Braves. Good score prediction. I'll just be different. Two, I'll go 3-2. I was going to say 2-1. I'll go 3-2 just to be different, but I love 2-1. Happy first Cal Quantrill day of the year. I mean, it's a little nerve-wracking considering the Diamondbacks put up 16 against Freeland. And now yeah, but they got Quantrill. all the runs out of the way. Yeah, they got all the runs out of the way. Uh, Rockies win. I'll go 14-0. I'll okay. go 14-0 Rockies. Yeah. Tovar 50, has an 8 50, RBI 50. day. 50. Uh, you know what? 15 is fair. Okay, just do the merch thing. Get yourself some just baseball merch people. You probably are like, well, Peter, are you wearing merch for all those watching on YouTube? Obviously, I'm wearing my just baseball tee. Jack's not wearing shit. Of course he's not. Don't be like Jack. Now he's putting it on. He's a freaking poser. Don't be like Jack. Go get your merch in the episode description. And if you've enjoyed the show... Please rate and review five stars, whether it be on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube. We're tired, but it's a good tired. And we'll see you on Monday. Again, remember, we're back to five days a week. That's Jack McMullen. I'm Peter Apple. And with that, thank you, everybody.